with information about that, and we will celebrate and usher in a wonderful Christmas as we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Let's have a word of prayer this morning, if you will join me in a word of prayer for this service. Father, I thank you for a wonderful season that we are ushering in, a month that we celebrate the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, I ask for strength, for discipline, as we take up the challenge to read one chapter a day, starting today from the book of Luke. Uh, Father, I ask for our cantata for the members of the choir in two weeks as they will present what they have practiced, prayed over. I ask that it would overwhelm us all with song to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. I ask for our Christmas Eve service that you would be with us, that we would honor you in celebrating this wonderful event. And Father, on Christmas, I would pray that while all of us will have presents and decorations and food and family, that we all here understand that the true reason, the true meaning that we're gathered together is to celebrate that one day you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to come in this world, to be born of a virgin into a manger in a lowly condition, and yet that same Savior would rise to take all of our sin on the cross of Calvary and three days later would rise defeating death, sin, and Satan and now rising back to his place at your right hand, making intercession for us daily. Father, it is a most wonderful time of year. Father, I thank you for the wonderful service that you have scheduled for us today and I would just ask that this service bring you honor and glory. For those that we have lifted up with needs, with prayer requests, with traveling, I ask that you minister to them, that you bring peace that passes all understanding. For those that are unable to come today, I would ask that you minister to them. But Father, may we all leave here today saying it was good to be in your house. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
I just want to say how beautiful I think the church looks I was, today. That's why I came back uh, out. That's why I came back out. <laughs> I said, I feel like we should all gather around the tree and yes, sing. Yes, yes. <laughs> sing praises to God. <laughs> That's the only reason I came back up taking Pastor Dan's time as I'm looking around. Think, well, first thing was, how come I can't see the projector screen? But because there's a beautiful tree there. Um, and the next thing I thought is, how beautiful our church looks today. It looks amazing. Amazing. So while we're all sitting down, if I could have the people that help make this happen stand up. I know you don't want to, but if you'll stand up just so that we can thank you. Um, yes, 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 yes. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Welcome to Community Church. Well, we're all so thankful that you chose to worship here today. We're thankful that you uh, braved the rain. And although it's not raining so hard right now, at 7 o'clock this morning, it was coming down pretty hard, wasn't it? Yeah, my dogs were like, nope, ain't going out. Nope. Um, we are so happy that you chose to worship with us today. We have some gift bags for you. If you're a first-time visitor with us, we would love for you to come down and get one. If you're with somebody from our church, send them down to get you a gift bag, and uh, you can have all of the goodies that are in that. And we're just so grateful that you're here. We're going to take a moment to uh, greet one another, stand up, and say hello and love on one another. Bible Bear, if you'll uh, wait for me over here uh, by the tree and all of the children... Uh, K through 5, if you would wait with Bible Bear, and we will leave in just a few moments to go to Children's Church. Everybody stand up and greet one another, please. If we could get our seats, if everybody could go ahead and take a seat. All righty. One of the prayer requests that was not mentioned is Pastor Tom is going to be going to the doctor for a procedure tomorrow morning, so please keep Pastor Tom in your prayers. And if you are a deacon, a deacon's wife, if you could meet me in his office after church, we're going to be praying for Pastor Tom. So 
Uh, please keep him in your prayers. He's going to have a procedure, and then he'll have a bigger, more serious procedure next week. All right, children, we're going to go to Children's Church in just a second, but how many of you like bread? Any of you like bread? Do you like toast? Yeah, do you like, like all kinds of good breads? Well, we're going to talk today about Jesus who said he was the bread of life, and I've got some bread down there for you. Yeah, as an object lesson. Yes, you can eat it. Yes. All right. Bible Bear, if you would lead them to Children's Church, please, and I will be right there. Father, I thank you for our choir this morning. Just closing my eyes and listening to that song, it is a taste, I believe, of what glory is going to be. Just a moment of peace and tranquility, a moment to hear your people praise you, even while they're in the very storms of life. Father, this is a congregation that knows what heartache is struggles, physical, emotional, financial. And yet I believe this is also a congregation that knows that you do not leave us. You don't forsake us. You're with us always. You care for us. Your eye is on us. You love us so very much. And even though we don't understand why we go through hard times, why we cry even when there's no more tears that can physically fall, even when we can't explain the issues and the circumstance and the trials that we have in the life that we're living, why we're up at 2 o'clock in the morning with our minds full. Father, may we never, ever cease to remember that you are in control, 
that you are in love with us and you are the best Father. Whether we can explain our lives or not, whether it's hard and difficult or not, Father, we know that this is not the end of our lives, but there is coming a day that we will cross over that River Jordan and we will be able to hear a choir that will resonate through the halls of glory for eternity with no more distraction, no more disruption. And Father, we look forward to that day. That is our blessed hope. So may today we have a taste of what glory to come is going to be like around your people, worshiping you in spirit and in truth, singing praises to your throne and just experiencing your power and your presence this very morning. Thank you for these pauses of life that you have allowed us to have on Sundays. We love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
Where, where is Miss Mary? Where is she? You got credit for that song. Well, well done. <coughs> that was great. Wait a second. Are they expecting me to get up there? <coughs> Take your Bibles out, if you will. I'm going to ask you to do something a little complex, but looking around, I think you have the ability to do this complex thing, and that is to turn to two different scriptures in the Bible. One in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, one at the very beginning of the Bible. So you're going to turn to Genesis chapter 4, Genesis chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, and then you're going to flip over to the New Testament. You're going to mark with your finger Hebrews 11, verse number 4. <clears throat> Hebrews 11, verse number 4, and Genesis chapter 4, 6 and 7. As we look at this title of a message from two different scriptures about the exact same topic, and the title is, We Are All Able. <clears throat> we Are All Able. While you're turning there, let me remind you today, there is a difference between believing God and believing in God. And that difference is faith. In fact, that difference, I would say today, has eternal consequences. In other words, you better know that you know that you know that you have faith and that that faith is placed in the right source. Amen. As we continue our series through Genesis, we have been honing on the first two brothers.
from Adam and Eve after they were expelled from the garden because sin came into the world. Cain and Abel and the tragic events surrounding the first murder is demonstrating to us that sin has effects. My wife has reminded me over and over again of that one statement that many of you have heard. Every time you play with sin, sin will always take you further than you want to go. And so we see sin taking Cain further, I am believing, further than maybe he even thought possible. Cain killing his brother Abel. In addition to Genesis chapter 4, this story is also explained differently in the New Testament, specifically Hebrews chapter 11. Many of us know that as the Hebrews' great hall of faith, a chapter in the Bible where we can see men and women of faith that have done exceedingly well in their service to God, blessed by God in a powerful way, agents of change in their world, strong, devout, unstoppable faith in God. And the first one mentioned in the Hebrews' great hall of faith is Abel. How appropriate, in my opinion, that he was the first one mentioned because I would say he was the first person of faith. What about Adam and Eve, his parents? Well, they walked with God, they talked with God, but theirs was a following by sight. Abel was a following by faith. His parents, Adam and Eve, walked with a God they could see. Abel walked with a God that he could not see. His parents were moved by a voice they could hear. Abel was moved by a voice that he could not hear. Abel is our father in faith, I would say, as he was the first to demonstrate our current life of now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, or the just shall live by faith. I'm very much looking forward to heaven. I'm looking forward to at the gates of glory hanging in my faith for sight and being able to see everything that I have believed ever since I came into faith. And so Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4 is where we will start, and in just a few moments, we will flip back and bring all of this together. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 4. By faith, Abel offered to God, and this is what I want you to absorb this morning, a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. Let's stop there. Number one, Abel offered a sacrifice. Interesting, the original wording in the Hebrew suggests that both of these brothers, Cain and Abel, knew that the offering of Abel was accepted as father either came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice or the flaming swords that stood guarding the path to the tree of life consumed the sacrifice. Either way, for both of them, Cain and Abel, when these brothers made sure they were where God wanted them to be, when God wanted them to be there, they discovered something that we all need today. God showed up. Friend, I want you to know today, and I've said this before, my paycheck is not contingent upon how many people show up on a Sunday. I'm sort of glad this morning for that. There's rain outside, empty seats, folks in hospitals. And I don't get a bonus when people are faithful week after week in coming to the house of God. I once had a job in insurance, and when my clients were faithful month after month in paying, then I got a bigger bonus. That is not the case here. If we double our attendance next week, I do not get a bonus in my paycheck. The reason that I am past, somebody said amen. <laughs> Yay. The reason that I am so passionate about folks, about you being in church, is because the Word of God commands us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, rain or shine. Commands the believer to be in God's house every day, every Sunday of every week, and as tough as it is, as I hear about sickness, heartache, job loss, even trying to minister to folks with a thousand miles separating us, hear about an accident that I believe an angel had a special hand in 
with a chainsaw and Joel. <laughs> Lumped off part of his nose. Thank God it wasn't. It's a chainsaw in your face. Thank God it wasn't worse. As I hear about accidents, as I hear about death, Betty having to say goodbye to her husband, Rhonda having to say goodbye to Sonia, Carolyn having to say goodbye to her brother, trying to minister as best I can from Florida, miles away. As I hear about sickness, had many, many surgeries, folks in the hospitals this past week, as I hear about job loss, folks suffering from depression and loneliness and defeat, especially this time of year, is difficult for many. I pray with and for folks that are struggling in their battles with the world and this flesh. I know that what people need more than anything isn't a phone call from Tom. It's not a visit from Pastor Dan. It's not even the surrounding and the encouragement from their brothers and sisters in Christ. What people hurting people need more than anything is a confrontation with Jesus Christ. They need the presence and they need the power of Almighty God. And the great news is that we learn from the story is that when you are where God wants you to be, when he wants you to be there, God always shows up. Even when the fellowship is grumpy. Even when somebody's sitting in your seat. Even when the music is off key and Dinah, God forbid, the choir's trying to teach us a new song. Even when technology seems to hurt instead of help the service. Even when you're in the audio sound booth and something goes wrong and 200 people at the same time turn around and look at you. <laughs> I'm back. Even when the sermon seems dry and you're struggling to stay awake. When you are where God wants you to be, when he wants you to be there, God always shows up. And when God shows up, you are confronted with his presence, you are confronted with his power, and that has the potential to change your life. <clears throat> Notice that Abel was, number one, not accepted by his actions. I want you to let that sink in for a minute because we, as frail people, before a holy and an almighty God, well-intentioned, we try to do real good to please our Father God. We try to do real good to please those people around us that are encouraging us, wanting us to be better, go further, do more. And we place so much attention on what we do that we neglect the more important thing that God is more concerned with. Remember, Abel was not accepted because of his actions, both Abel and Cain went to God when God told them to go, brought a sacrifice, and they did it all when God told them to do it. Both believed God or else neither one of them would have shown up. But again, there's a difference between believing God and believing in God. On the surface, you could not have been able to tell Cain and Abel apart. They were both at the altar of God, both bringing a sacrifice, both on the appointed day, both had an offering, and yet I am saying today, because the Word of God is saying today, that was not enough. You are here today, and I will be honest, I will give you credit, you didn't have to be here today. Unless you're a child that was drugged to church by awesome parents, I might add, you had a choice to be here. Some of you came and your spouse isn't here. You came anyway. Some of you don't feel well. You came anyway. Some of you are hurting. You came anyway. You didn't have to, but you did. You chose to climb out of that comfortable bed, some making more noise than others. Someone once said that after you hit 50, snap, crackle, pop is not a cereal anymore. It's the sounds that you make when you move. And yet you got up anyway, you got ready, you came out, and there are many things, other things, you could be doing right now. You could be curled up on the couch, the blanket, 
the fireplace roaring, a dog, cat laying next to you, nice cup of coffee. Wait a second, y'all are going to leave, aren't you? <laughs> nice cup of coffee in your hand. You could have been doing that. And I know many of you had a long, hard, difficult week, and I understand my, my wife and I went to a financial counselor at her work, and they said, all right, you can retire in four and a half years. So this is the plan. Thank God. Yay. Four and a half years. And all of a sudden, I'm going around celebrating. Wow, four and a half years. We is on a beach and fishing and waking up when we want. And I've been told by those that have retired, Fast Tom, that's just hockey. I've been more busy since I retired than I was when I was working. So I say to everybody today, most of you had a long, hard, difficult week. Today may be your only day off, the only day that you get to do what you want to do. I mean, if God knows everything, He's watching, He knows, shouldn't we be getting credit from God just by being here today? You should have now the entire week blessed by God, provided by God, since you were where He wanted you to be when He wanted you to be there, right? The point is, it may have been inconvenient for you to be here today, and God should know that and give you some kind of bonus credit, maybe for walking someone in with an umbrella, holding on a door for someone, singing all the songs, donating money in the offering plate. Therefore, God should accept your offering today, bless your week, send you back home, all precisely at 12 o'clock. Lord knows you like to make it to K&W at a decent hour. Cain did all of those things, but he soon found out, as we should be well aware today, those things were not enough. In fact, your attendance to church, your offering in the plate, your singing of your songs, working in the nursery, teaching children Sunday school class, playing the piano, leading the choir, singing in the choir, working in the audio visual booth, preaching a sermon are all just things unless you have a sincere heart of integrity before God that produces a passionate worship to God. We find out in the story, in fact, I believe the strongest message as we bring these two scriptures together is a reminder that God is not as concerned with what you do as He is who you are. Abel's offering was not accepted by his actions. Abel's offering was accepted because of his attitude. I believe with all my heart a lot hinges, more hinges, I think, on what you give credit to than your attitude, than anything else. His offering was accepted because of his attitude. One could argue the offering from Cain was not accepted because of the quality. It was a non-living sacrifice. Abel brought a living sacrifice. Cain didn't bring a living sacrifice. Others would argue it wasn't accepted because of a ritualistic error, oversight, inconsistency, form over function. However, while many educated folks seem to dwell on the what-ifs. Our answer is not to be found in our own reasoning. I think that is a big issue with a lot of younger people in this culture. They rely so much on what they feel, on their emotion. And I am a man today that believes with all my heart our emotions and our feelings can be wrong. We cannot follow our heart. We must follow Christ and obey His Word. That is the standard by which we ought to live. And sometimes, yes, the Word goes against our feelings. Sometimes the Word goes against our emotion. Sometimes the Word offends us, convicts us. But I'm here today to tell you the Word of God is always right. And so it's the Word of God that we look to, recognize that has all the answers. So now let's turn to Genesis chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. This is what God's Word says. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin, remember that word, is crouching at the door. It's desire for you, but you must rule over it. Folks, let me first of all say that sin hasn't changed. Sin is still crouching at the door of your life, 
desiring you, wanting to control you, wanting to throw you, wanting to disrupt you. And if sin has its way, it will bring you all the way to the pits of hell. We must be aware of the potential that sin has. And so now that we have read that text, in addition to the Hebrews, why was Cain's offering not accepted? Some theologians believe that, and this is where I land, my opinion, Abel offered a sacrifice for sin. Cable, Cable? I have ADD, and I just had this picture of all those implants in my spine, which will be zapping me with electricity. And I just had this image next Sunday of me preaching and one of them going haywire in the middle of a sermon. <laughs> just sharing what goes on in my mind as I stand before you. Abel offered a sacrifice for sin. Cain offered a sacrifice for thanksgiving. And that is why Cain's sacrifice was not accepted. That's interesting. Pastor, what's wrong with being thankful to God? What's wrong with Cain going before God and saying, God, this is my offering of thanks. I'm thankful for who you are and what you have done. What is wrong with that? Why wouldn't God accept that? And I will give you my two cents. I believe this speaks more of our culture today than any other generation that has ever lived. And here it is. How easy it is to thank God for all the things in life and yet never deal with the sin in our life. It's easy, prepare to be offended. It's easy to thank God for the girlfriend that he gave you and then have sex with her outside of holy matrimony. It's easy to thank God for the job that you have in the paycheck, yet refuse to honor him through your tithes and offerings, investment into the kingdom. You thank God for your health, only to pull up to McDonald's, order two Big Mac combos, supersize everything, and then order a Diet Coke to salve the guilt that comes over you. I've seen you. And then after you meal, you head to the tanning booth to zap radiation in your body so you can look better. And then that night, head to the club for a few drinks. Get home, sit in your lazy boy. You glance over at that treadmill that now is the hanger for all the clothes that you need to iron. There's still a few people not offended, so let me continue. <laughs> you light up another cigarette, and then you pop a doctor-prescribed pill to help you sleep, but for some reason, your body just doesn't feel right. Friend, hear me in all seriousness, something I have learned and at times still learn. You will never really be able to thank God for anything until the sin in your life is dealt with. That is why I'm so animate, passionate, and bold to keep urging you to be sure that your sacrifice has been accepted by God. And the only way you can be sure that your sacrifice has been accepted by a holy judge that sits on his throne and still judges sin the way he has always judged sin is to make sure that your sacrifice is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Not your works, lest any man should boast. Not religion, but Christ and Christ alone. Number two, Abel obtained salvation. Look at verse number one, the end of it. Chapter 11, Hebrews. We'll wrap it up, it gets better. Through which he was commended as righteous, Abel. God commending him, Abel, by accepting his gifts. I want you to know today that I was not drawn to the gospel because of the prospect of heaven. I wasn't drawn to the response. I, I didn't respond to the invitation to come because I wanted to walk the streets of gold and move up to my mansion on a hilltop. I didn't even know those things existed. I wasn't brought up in church. I never heard the Bible taught or preached. I wasn't drawn to the gospel. And I didn't respond to the invitation to come because I wanted those things in heaven. I was drawn 
because I wanted to be accepted by God, adopted by God, be part of the family of God, to be forgiven of all my sin, have victory, have purpose, have love, have peace. I wanted to be loved by God for an eternity so that I could be commended as righteous. We can only experience these things if, number one, there is a sacrifice for our sin. From the very moment sin entered into the world, we found as Adam and Eve ate of the apple, they were expelled from the Garden of Eden, and they found there had to be a sacrifice for sin had to be dealt with. And the only answer that has ever been is blood has to be shed. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. And this is not an outdated issue, doctrine of antiquity. God hasn't changed. Your sin today, 2019, requires a sacrifice, requires the shedding of blood. This world has so many options available to you, though. A lot of religions out there, a lot of ways out there. Nothing has changed. Sin requires bloodshed. There are so many options. For the sake of time, I'll just list a few. Buddhism points to the teachings of Buddha for hope. Islam would point you to the Quran and their prophet Muhammad, which they say is better than Jesus. Amen. He's not. Hindus would tell you to pick your pick, and I'm not kidding. They have over 330 million gods for which to you to choose to worship. In fact, one of their most revered saints said this, and I quote, there could be as many Hindu gods as there are devotees to suit their moods, feelings, and emotions, unquote. New Agers would tell you that hope is to be found within yourself, that you have all the hope and power you need. You need no one else. Mormons would say that if your works are superior, you have no need for a God higher than you because you can become a God. Jehovah Witnesses argue that hope cannot be found in Jesus Christ. I don't, say what, I don't care what they say when they come knocking at your door. As well-intentioned, sincere, and devoted as they are, and let me say, unfortunately, tragically for us, there are a lot more devoted Jehovah Witnesses walking on the doors in this community than there are born-again believers that have been washed by the blood. Jehovah Witnesses argue that hope cannot be found in Jesus Christ because he was just an angel. He was Michael the archangel, and that Jesus is much less powerful than God. Agnostics would say that perhaps there's a God, perhaps there may be hope. We just all have to wait it out and hope for the best in the end. And atheists, well, they're very quick to declare there is no hope. Here's the great news. All of those folks are wrong. They are all wrong. And if they continue on their current path, they will end up separated from a holy and just God in a devil's hell. So what then? What is the answer? The answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is hope, and that hope is through our faith in our Lord and our Savior, Jesus. He stepped out from eternity, introduced himself to humanity. He said it's not the Baptist way, the Mormon way, the Jehovah Witness way, the Buddhist way, the Hindu way, the Islam way. Jesus, the Son of God, declared with authority and integrity, I am the way, the life, and the truth. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is our only hope. <clears throat> and solemn worship to the Savior. Once Abel's offering was accepted, he was commended as righteous. I know there's a lot of miracles out there, and I get it. I've seen God do some wonderful things. I think Joel's nose just being partly sawed off by a chainsaw is a miracle. I think Ken Gibson being able to walk and talk louder and faster is a miracle. I think there's a lot of great miracles. An 18-year-old girl in our youth group who has been struggling with a cancer diagnosis is in church this morning smiling and praising God 
for God delivering her. I think there are great miracles out there. I have seen God heal people. I have seen God turn financial situations around. I have seen mothers in this congregation pray for their sons to have jobs they haven't had for six months, and all of a sudden God blesses them with a job that was beyond what they could have even imagined, much better than the one before. I even thank God for a great wife that I have that, listen, after almost 30 years, is still with me. Yay me. But I'm telling you right now, friend, take your attention off of all those miracles. That's just gravy. The greatest miracle that you can witness today is your salvation for you to have a story of God taking you from the grips of sin and placing you in the grips of a Savior, giving you a home and a purpose and a future and overwhelming you with love and blessing you with His power and blessing you with His presence and just making your mind be blown of how wonderful our Father is and a sanctified life. Listen, Abel wasn't a closet, keep in the private, leave me alone, I'm an introvert type of believer. In fact, he was the very first martyr. Pastor, I thought Stephen was the first martyr. No, I believe Abel was the first martyr. He was the first one to be killed for his relationship with the Lord. Abel couldn't help obeying his parents, serving his Lord, going to church, being an example of faith thousands of years later. He couldn't help it. Folks, I... I am a firm believer, and I am convinced if you have been touched by the power of God and you have been transformed by the renewing of your mind, if you have had a confrontation with the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ, and your life is completely different, you're going to be a can't-help-it Christian. I can't help but sing. I can't help but witness. I can't help but teach. I can't help but preach. I can't help but smile. I can't help it because I got Christ in my life. This next last point, we'll get this side clapping. (laughs) Lastly, Abel's ongoing sermon. No, that is not prophetic of this morning. A sermon that never ends. Look at verse number one at the end. And through his faith, Abel, though he died, he still speaks. That's interesting. You know, we were just down in Disney area. We only went to the park a couple times, a couple hours, a shot. We've been down there so much that it's just, you know, commonplace to us. Um, I went there. I was there the first day in 1971 when it opened, the grand opening. Don't remember much. I was in a carrier saying goo. Went there almost every weekend in high school. Went there on our honeymoon. Our kids have gone there dozens of times. Kimberly, how many times do you think off your head we've been to Disney? Yeah, she's like, I don't even know anymore. We have our traditions. We always go to the Magic Kingdom first, go to the left, and we go to the Haunted Mansion first, and then Pirates of the Caribbean. It's our tradition. In the Pirates of the Caribbean, which is one of my favorite rides, in one spot as you're riding in a boat down a dark, damp, dusky, misty tunnel, sounds like Withful last night as we drove through, you can hear these eerie voices chanting, Dead men tell no tales. I'm going to apply for that job. Dead men tell no tales, but the truth is, from this story, yes, they do. Our voices continue to go. Abel had an ongoing sermon. Hebrews 11.1, he still speaks. We have a voice now, but I pray through this example in faith and able, you understand today that more important to your voice today is the voice that you have that will be heard generation after generation when you leave this life. He spoke in the past. Abel spoke from the grave to God when he asked God to vindicate the innocent blood that was spilled. Much like those tribulation saints under the altar in Revelation chapter number 5, crying out to God. And he spoke to his brother. God said to Cain that the very ground was reaching out against him. The very ground would be his curse. That's Abel speaking. But I want you to know today, the words that you have today are not primary. Raise your hand if you remember Jerry Canada. Jerry Canada. He would sing for us. He would dance for us. He moved to Richmond a few years ago. Before he moved, he gave me a quote that I wrote down. 
It's very pertinent today, this quote, because now Jerry is faced with cancer. The doctors don't know how much longer he has to live. This is what he said, and I quote, As I survey my life, I am more convinced now ever than what matters the most is not what you have when you die, but what you leave behind. Randy Travis had something similar. It's not what you take when you leave this world behind you, it's what you leave behind when you go. And that brings us to my final point. He speaks in the present. What we say in the past by our lives determines what we speak to upcoming generations. And it's as if, if I look at this text, Abel wrote his own sermon. Three points, all very brief, succinct. The first he is saying we need to approach God by faith. Again, our works are not enough. If we could have been perfect and save ourselves, stand before God as pure and as spotless, then God would not have had to send His only begotten Son into this world to suffer as a sacrifice, to bleed, to die on a cross of Calvary. The only way for unworthy, rebellious, undeserving sinners like us to stand before a holy and just God is through faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Secondly, adhere to God's commands. Hear me, you will never. There are people in this very room that are struggling with this issue at this very moment. You will never, ever experience true, deep down, lasting joy until you completely surrender to the will of God for your life. You can pray all you want, give all you want, read the Bible all you want, attend church all you want, listen to Spirit FM and wear the Christian t-shirts. But I am telling you right now from experience, the key to victory is simply doing what you know to be the will of God for your life. Lastly, all sin is to be judged. God hated sin then, He judged it. God hates sin now, He judges it. As a child of God, I'm not saying I'm better than you. If you're not a believer today, I'm not better because I go to church every time the doors are open. I read my Bible every day. I pray often. I'm not better because I put money in the offering plate. I'm not better than you if you're not a Christian, and I am. I'm not better, but I'll tell you today, from experience, I am better off. I'm better off not because of what I have done or who I am. Better off because of what Christ has done and who Christ is. Better off because my sins have already been judged on the cross of Calvary over 2,000 years ago. But I recognize that does not give me a license to sin freely, nor should it you, but requires a daily surrender to Him and a separated, sanctified, holy life before God the Father. Lastly, He still speaks is a statement that conveys the idea that we must have vision. While we're living on this earth, to be cognizant of the fact that our words today, our actions today, will carry on to generations we haven't even seen. Our actions, our lives today will speak to generations to come, and they have the potential to build someone up or break someone down. To speak highly of Jesus, exalted, magnified, glorified as Jesus Christ, as enough for any life or as hypocrisy. Billy Graham in his 90s, right before he died, he wrote a book, Nearing Home, Life, Faith, and Finishing Well. It's in our library. He states this, and I quote, not your money or the other material things that you have accumulated in your life. The greatest legacy you can pass on is the legacy of your character and your faith, unquote. We're going to have a moment of invitation. I'm going to ask Dinah to come and Brother Bob's going to play on the piano, but as they're coming, I believe this is all a matter of vision. I think we are in a culture that struggles to look beyond ourselves. Does that make sense? This world is very selfish. We can be very selfish. It's hard to look beyond ourselves. In fact, we were listening to a news report on the road yesterday coming in from Orlando, and it was a principal that had got rid of all the phones from cafeteria time, from lunchtime. And the students were saying, it is an amazing thing that's happened. 
We're looking at each other. And then they said something else. My wife was watching it on her phone. I was both hands on the wheel, eyes forward. But I heard it. One of the students says, said, it's like Mary did you knows. One of the students said, the odd thing that has happened since we got rid of phones and we're looking at each other, we're a lot nicer to each other. We're getting to know each other. One of the problems that we're facing in our culture is that we're self-consumed. We have no vision. This scripture above all ought to remind us that God is holding us accountable for how we live, what we say, what we do in this life because not only does it affect the people around us now, but it'll affect the people around us when we leave. We never get done talking. I was at a church, and this broke my heart. I was at a church, and one of the members lost a child. His name was Tracy. As a pastor, that's probably one of the most difficult things I could ever do, walk into a house with the police to let the mom know that their child had died in a car accident. The church wanted to do a great thing, and their committee was formed, and they decided to plant a tree in that child's honor, a Tracy tree. You remember that, Becky? A Tracy tree. So I came out to the ceremony. I, read a po I wrote a poem for the occasion. I called it Tracy's Tree. I wrote a poem, and I read the poem at the service as we stood around the tree. I looked over at the tree, and the tree was only about a foot from the brick of the sanctuary. So after the service was over, I went to one of the property committee guys, and I said, why is the tree so close to the church? Aren't the roots going to tear up the church in a few years? And this is what he said. I won't be here. I'm not worried about it. Folks, your life, it makes a difference. Your words make a difference. Make sure they are filtered through the love of God. Not just for the people around you now, but for the people you leave behind. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, as your word is allowed to settle into our hearts this morning, 